Now, I just praise God for the spirit of Almighty God being in these young people that they sing the praises of God with conviction and knowing that the potter will put you back together again, regardless as to the brokenness of anyone's life, God can and he will through and by his Holy Spirit put you back together again. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, this opportunity once again that has been afforded to us to come and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, it's another time and opportunity that you have afforded this your servant to speak unto these thy people. And I ask once again, O Heavenly Father, if you please, just hide this your servant behind the cross, that those who are here might see thee and not me. Father, let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my strength and my redeemer. In the name of Christ, we ask this all. Amen. Amen. It's good to see all of you this morning. I am so thankful to have been able to baptize all these beautiful young people this morning. Amen. Amen. God bless all of you. Your faith walk is just beginning at this time, but I promise you, you can walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, Brother Luther over there, I had the opportunity of doing the premarital counseling for he and his wife who had just gotten married and met your mom a few minutes ago, and I declare I thought it was your sister. Uh, she looks too young to be your mama, boy. I want y'all to know that, but you, you, it's just a beautiful family, and I thank God for all of you, the conviction that you've made, the commitment that you've made to follow Christ. Uh, he'll be with you every step of the way. I promise you, young people, he will. God bless you. It is good, once again, to be here in the house of the Lord. And this morning, our young adult ministry has given such a wonderful welcome and telling about the events that they're going to have coming up the first part of August. Thank God for our youth of the church, the young adults of the church, uh, who are are active in ministry. I praise God for you all and what you mean to the ministry of Lake Providence. Two of these wonderful young ladies back here this morning had just sung a song and they got out of breath and they were tired. Where y'all at? Wave your hand. They, uh, uh, they were just out of breath when they gave the welcome. They said, oh, I'm tired. Yeah, where y'all singing? I'd be tired too. But God bless you and keep on singing the praises of God. For those of you who have your Bibles with you on this this morning, I invite you to a New Testament passage of Scripture, the book of Galatians, and we're going to the second chapter. It was ironic this morning that at the 8 o'clock worship, Reverend Lyons spoke from Galatians also, and I think he took it from chapter 3, and chapter 3 is actually talking about justification by faith. The church uh, at Galatia uh, in the Asia Minor area as to where it's believed it was written to, not just to specific group, but to several of the churches in that particular area had come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And something had happened within the church also. And just for a little bit of historical background, what had happened in the church, you had the people who were devout Jews who had come to know Christ and who had come to serve him, uh, but they wanted to connect sort of to speak, and they wanted to connect the church and those who were coming into the church who were Gentile back into the customs of the Old Testament law. So what was trying to be combined here is law with grace. And that is so important to understand because of this, God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, and we come under the age of grace. The law had no power whatsoever to save in and of itself. It was the schoolmaster. It was the guideline. It was the way in which we would conduct our lives. It was the right and wrong as far as things were concerned. And what I mean by that, the law taught us to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. It taught us thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear for 
false witness. And then there were other laws other than the Ten Commandments. When you get back into the book of Leviticus and you begin to study, there were dietary laws. There were laws of sacrifice that had to be made if you committed this sin. You were to offer this type of sacrifice if you did this and you stepped outside the law. You were to offer, uh, take an offering to the high priest so that he could offer it for you on the behalf of your sins. But the law of the Old Testament, the blood of bullocks and bulls and goats and turtle doves could not bring us into a perfect sacrifice for our sins. You understand that? I want to help you. Here's what I'm saying. Christ had to come. He had to die for our sins. He had to deliver us from underneath all of those laws of the Old Testament so that we would not be caught up in ritualism as to where we were going through the motions. When you come to the book of Malachi and the questions that are asked in the book of Malachi, Israel was now just going through the motion. There was no spirit in what they were doing. They knew this was customary. They knew these things were to be done, but there was no spiritual, honest, open giving of oneself to the Lord. That's the reason why when we read the scripture on Sunday, when we take up offering, will a man rob God? And he says, yet you have robbed me. And they said, where did we rob you? And he says, in tithe and offering. They had robbed God. They had come to the point where they walked out outside of what the law was, and now they had gone contrary to the will of God. But what we have here, when we come to the New Testament, Christ has now died. He was the perfect sacrifice for sin. That's the reason why the, 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 I think the Christian anthem almost is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the reason why we profess by faith that to be something special to us. But notice something, when you get into the epistles that are being written to different places, different churches, problems have already come up in the church. Problems that are in the church, problems as to where people have now tried to burden down those who now walk by faith. Problems as to where they're trying to lead them back into a faith or a salvation that is based up on works. None of our salvation, none of what we do, none of how good we can get brings us into favor with the Holy God. The Bible teaches us that all of our righteousness, that's the best that we have to offer, is as filthy rags before a holy God. See, this thing is an act of grace. This thing is an act of God's favor. What has just happened to all of you beautiful young people who were just baptized into the church family, you came unto Jesus just as you were weary, wounded, sad. You found in him a resting place, and now he makes you glad. What I'm talking about is this. All of what you used to be was all of the sins that were on the, of the past, all the things that you did wrong once in your life. Now they have been placed under the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And when God sees you, what he sees you as is the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Because every time Time he looks at any of us. He has to see us through the supreme sacrifice that was paid for our sins, which was Christ. 
That's the reason why we have forgiveness. That's the reason why we have an understanding as to who God is. And that's the reason why we can now build a relationship through Jesus Christ, our elder brother, our big brother. He's the one that paid for our sins. But why are you stressing all that? Because of what happens in the book of Galatians. What happens is this. Go with me. Uh, uh, um, I'm going to find it. It's, it's right there in chapter 1. Paul is writing. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ, the Son, the, uh, Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me. He says to the churches at Galatia, grace to you, peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Stop right there. Look at what he is proclaiming to the church. Grace to you, the grace of God, the amazing grace of God. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Grace, unmerited favor. Grace, something that we come into that we don't rightfully deserve. Grace, when it should have been just judgment and justice that was put upon us. But now we have been justified by faith. And what happens when you get justified by the faith that you have? in your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you stand before God just as if you'd never sinned. Ain't God good? That's awesome. You stand before a holy God standing in the righteousness, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Grace to you and peace from our God and Father and Lord uh, Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. That's what Christ did. Christ came in order to be the perfect sacrifice that would be paid for the sins of mankind. God knew that it was no possible way with everything that we could do to come back in fellowship with him had he not sent his son. God knew. God showed up in the Old Testament in the form of his, serv- uh, 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 his son, Jesus Christ. It is so many references and time that we see Christ in the middle of the Old Testament. I'm so glad he's there. I'm so glad he is the sacrifice for, for our sins. You ask, how did he show, where did he show up at? Y'all remember when uh, uh, the king was throwing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire furnace? He was there in the middle of the furnace because the king even looked in. He said, did not we cast in three? He said, but behold, I see four, and the fourth is as the son of God. Jesus showed up in the middle of the fiery furnace. There are times that are written and times that are requested in the Old Testament as to where the Father, Son, Holy Spirit shows up all at one time. And I am so glad that he sent his son to die for our sins. But I want to show you what the problem was inside of that church. Go to verse 6, and this is what we find ourselves in in this day and time. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you to the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. What is happening in our world today? 
We're living in a time when there are those who are striving to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're living at a time when people want to change the word of God to make it fit what they're doing. We're living in a time when people do not want to accept the fact of what they're doing is sin and they want to make it all right according to the word. But you can't change the standard of God. We have no right to do that. Sin is sin, but God has given the remedy for sin. Sin is going to always be. Sin is going to be something that is ever present in lives that are here on the face of this earth. Sin is going to be something that we'll be in a battle against from the day we are born to the day that we die. But God has sent his son as the remedy for sin. God has sent his son to atone for our sin. And what was happening in the church, he says they were turning away. They were turning away so soon from him who called them to the grace of Christ to a different gospel. He says, which is not another. He said, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But here is the warning. And this is the warning for all of us in this day and time. You, you, one of the things that I challenge, and those of you who are visiting with us, I challenge the members of Lake Providence to study God's word for themselves. I, that's the reason why we offer so many study courses around here. And we don't, don't just sit around and study. We witness about the glory of God. We have outreach teams in the community. We have those who do outreach work to the Nashville Union Rescue Mission, to the jail downtown, to different institutes of, of those who are in nursing homes and everywhere. We take to them the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. See, if God just saved us and we just just decided to stay here. The word of God cannot be translated into the world and it may have effect if we just get saved and saved and sanctified and sit on our sanctification. We can't do that. We have an obligation. We have an obligation to witness to others of this glorious power that God has instilled into us. We have the obligation to tell somebody else, to testify to someone else about the goodness of God. We have uh, uh, the obligation to sing to them the songs of old amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And when they thought, when we sing that and people ask, what are you talking about? Tell them of the glorious gospel. Tell them of a Savior who died for your sins. Look at what he said. He says, but here's the warning in verse 8. It says, but if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you other than what has been preached to you, he says, let them be accursed. In other words, let a curse fall upon those who preach another gospel. Let a curse fall upon those who strive to change the word of God and twist it in another way. Let a curse be upon those who are not walking by faith and not by sight. Let a curse be upon those who deny that the blood of Jesus has saving power. Let a curse be upon those who don't accept the fact that God God's word is final authority. God's word is final authority. God's word is, 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 is our guidebook. God's word is the way in which we should walk. God's word gives us the guideline for holy living. God's word it comforts us in the lonely hour. God's word is our shelter in the time of storm. God's word is our bridge over troubled water. God's word is our security. God's word is my salvation. That's where I find my salvation. God's word is where I find encouragement. When no one else will encourage me, I find encouragement in the word of God. There are times when it seems like we walk alone in this world. 
But every time you feel like you're alone, y'all hear me? Every time you feel like the world is against you, pick up the Word of God and start to read. And when you read it, if you don't know of anything else to read, read that familiar passage that, that David wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. Hello, I got ownership. He's my shepherd and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in cream pasture. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemy. You will anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely, surely, I've got confidence. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's where I find my encouragement. I don't have to get the pat on the back. I don't have to get the accolades from this world. I have encouragement in the word of God. But he warns us. He says, if we or even an angel of heaven preach unto you any other gospel than what has ever been preached, he said, let him be a curse. You see that? And then verse 9 says, as we have said before, he says, so now I say again. In other words, I want, to, I want to repeat myself one more time. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you have received, he says, let them be a curse. In other words, don't go by every wind of doctrine that comes down the road. Stay in the word of God. Stay on solid ground. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. This morning, do you know him? Have you planted yourself in his word? Have you secured yourself in knowing that you're saved because of the blood of Jesus? If you haven't, I want to help you to understand that. And we're here as a church family to help you dig deep and get on a solid foundation. This morning, by letter, by Christian experience, by candidate for baptism, if there's someone here who don't even have a church home, come. If you've just moved into the city and you're seeking a church home, we'd love to have you here in this family of God. Our deacons are coming out to receive you into this church family. Just step out in the aisle and come down to the front. If you're scared to come, 